Imagine your history as a timeline. How many highs and lows have you experienced? Joys, pain, overcoming, obstacles. And the truth is that the line is not linear. And there are internal and external factors that influence it all the time in our journey. And they become unique and complex. But what if we could be responsible for one a stimuli that could impact positively a whole life? And what if we created opportunities to mitigate vulnerabilities and in a way change the trajectory? We believe that yes, that is possible. And that's why since 2003, we support inspiring projects with the goal of having a social protagonism. We believe we can generate impact today so that happier versions of this history can be written in a close future. CPFL Institute, an energy that transforms reality. Hello, guys. We would like to share this moment with you. 2023, Café Filosófico CPFL has 20 years anniversary, so it is over 950 speak, uh, talks and over 2,000 episodes in TV Cultura, a digital community of almost 1 million people. 1,200 videos on YouTube with over 42 million views. In these 20 years, we have built more than numbers. We've built relationships and we connect histories. All of that was only possible because you are part of this history. Café thanks the technical team, all of our friends, the speakers, curators, and a special thanks to you. To have a sample of all the topics that we addressed in two decades, we are going to see some of the hosts that made part of this history. Hello. In Café Filosófico, a partnership between TV Cultura and CPFL Energia, how is the relationship in the modern couples. How is desire born? What women hid from women and from themselves? We we are more afraid now than we were in the past. Our man has always been a tormented animal. We are all the time facing big or small decisions. These or that, right or wrong, good or bad. We can or we can't. And for this flame not burn inside of us and getting fired all around us, what should we do? Who broke the law of eternity that doesn't allow to start life? If uh, idleness is the beginning of all vices, at least it's close to all the virtues. I've learned that my strength is knowing all the weaknesses that they were pointed out in me. How can the work configuration contribute to change the social composition of Brazil and make a new middle class come up? And we're going to ask ourselves, is that a good drug? Art is a way of feeling the coming of the object. That that has already become doesn't matter anymore. And the pursuit for everyone is single. What is fiction for? To explain and interpret the human reality through fantasy? Good evening. Welcome to another recording of Café Filosófico CPFL. Thank you all that are here in Campinas during our recording and everyone watching us over the internet, on Instagram and on YouTube. I request that you please subscribe to our channel. Just click on subscribe so you know before in first hand all the videos that we upload every week. Today we continue the module traditional Chinese medicine, self-care and preservation of life with the curatorship of Bruto de Conte and the Confucian Institute of Unicamp. Today we address the topic traditional Chinese medicine, clinical contributions and philosophical provocations. 
and we are going to welcome Gustavo Tenorio Cunha to talk about it. So let's have him with a round of applause. Gustavo is doctor in collective health by Unicamp, professor in the collective health of Unicamp since 2015, researching in health management and first attention with formation in acupuncture and physiotherapy in the Chinese medicine. So welcome to Café Filosófico. The floor is yours. Good evening. I'm going to start by thanking the organizers of the café, the curator Bruno, Confucian Institute, the Economy Institute at Unicamp, and greet Café Filosófico for their 20 years of incentive to the philosophical art, to the scientific disclosure, to the critical thinking, and start by greeting all the workers at the public health system in Brazil over the difficulties in the past six years. Last year, they were able to have over 2 million procedures in Chinese medicine in the public health system with all the difficulties. A part, a big part of it, were auriculotherapy, including acupuncture, and a special part are corporal or bodily parts in health centers with the community agents. And I would like to greet the over 250,000 health professionals, not only doctors, but all the professionals that practice at SUS and outside of SUS, the Chinese medicine. So this is a construction in the past 20 years in the progressive increase, not only in Brazil, but also in the whole world. And I would like to tell you where I'm coming from. So I come from the collective health area. I'm a sanitarist in Brazil. And from this perspective, we have a concern with the public health system, the clinical practices of the professionals, how people are served, what works, what works better, what doesn't work. And so from this perspective, every time we talk about a new technology, every time we talk a new medication, any changes in the system, any improvements, because the space we work from, we are always looking for a diagnosis of the problems and consider how to improve. So we always take a very special care to have solutions and proposals from within the health system as something that comes after the health conditions, the social public policies, social rights, because we live in a country in which we have a, a robust public health system, but we still struggle with inequalities, with hunger, with violence, and as good as a health system is, it is palliative when these policies have any difficulties. So this is a principle that we work with the idea of small changes that can be beneficial and um, are, are they going to be uh, negative for our people? So we have to consider small changes that can be good for a few people. Uh, for a few people and this is better. So we consider that in a system. So this is what we call health social determinants and it's defined in our constitution, in our legislation, but it's an important concern because health is the result of a set of policies that define the way we live, our social and economical organization. That's why we have so many friends in the economy. Um, department because we have similar concerns. And I would like to start by telling you that the traditional medicines exist pretty much in all countries in the world. 
é que o puncher is one of the most popular practices, the one that is well most well known, and um, besides the traditional medicine, especially the Chinese one, is something that the WHO has uh, recommended for a while, and the countries in the world use these practices. And uh, this is a point from which I would like to start our conversation. So why does the Cuban system or the best ones in the world like the English and other public health systems around the world would apply and bet on the growth and the increase of these traditional practices? One hypothesis that is very strong in collective health, and there have uh, been so many studies and investigations, the hypothesis that our dominant model of the biomedicine or the hegemonic rationality practice has issues. A growth in the traditional medicines and the integrative practices, this kind of therapeutics, have a relation with these difficulties that are intrinsic. One of the difficulties that is more generic. So just to have a counterpoint here, health systems look at the knowledge that is existing as if they have to choose either this or that knowledge. For most of the health systems, the matter is not so much which to choose because we work with a great amount of professionals. We work in Brazil, for example, with 15 different professionals and each one has their specialties and the care, the quality of the care depends on a synergic interaction between all these points of service, these different perspectives. So in this context of complexity in the care, in the sickness and in the getting old process, the traditional medicines are a different and another perspective and a special kind of perspective most of the times in comparison to our well-known professions. And the other aspect that makes us have uh, to be more open in SUS, for example, in different public health systems, it is the damages. So in the area of collective health, we have this position that is not so uh, joyful, but we have to look at damages. And there is a tradition in the world public health that gets stronger around the 70s of considering the kind of damage or the atrogenies, the kind of problems that we produce with the way we work more commonly. So a thinker wrote the expropriation of the health. His name is Ivan Elite, and he split the kinds of damages if it's organic atrogeny or cultural atrogeny or social atrogeny. And we use it pretty much the same distribution. So the organic atrogeny is easy for us to notice because in the collective point of view, you have the prescriptions of uh, medicine and uh, we hope all the side effects, they hope they don't work or they are not so many, but in a collective perspective, it's not uh, whether it's going to work or not, but how much. So we have the intrinsic damage, the error, uh, but the intrinsic perspective. So we have a percentage of hospital infections. We have the abuse of treatments of substances. For example, if we think about uh, the surgical labor, it is a conquering humanity, but 100% of them being surgical can go to the side of the damage. So the idea of the organic damage is related to the traditional medicine and the Chinese one particularly, 
because it, there are many practices, many techniques that are not using medication. So if we think of anti-inflammatory and uh, medications that have significant side effects, the acupuncture, for example, it's an alternative, a safer alternative. It's less complicated. So we have a problem also regarding the organic damages that's about the entire industrial complex that's around health. So when we have private systems, this complex is stronger. So the United States frequently is a negative model of health system, public health system, because it's a system that the health is a merchandise, is not a right. Some studies have showed the last years, first it was in 2000 and then 2016, that the third cause of mortality is caused by the action of the health system. So this is really an issue. So in a scenario like this, the less invasive practices, the practices that try to work in another logic, they also are more relevant. And we have also self-immune disease, allergies, that the conventional treatment, also is chronic treatment, immune suppression. For traditional medicines, we have better proposals, that, especially the Chinese medicine, also problems regarding periods, endometriosis, health problems that we have an intervention with undesirable effects, with side effects. Another type of atrogeny and the cultural one. So really it is used to say that this is the decrease of the autonomy of people of taking care of themselves. So we were suffering a cultural change that he notices in the 70s. And he mentions this decrease, this progressive decrease of the people of taking care of themselves and this idea that for anything of the daily routine life, there's a, a medicine or a substance. This idea that we need a professional to handle the symptoms and also the traditional medicines, they go to another side, as I have mentioned, the body practices, a lot of seats in Brazil, Campinas, for example, in a certain moment, we're able to decrease the use of anti-inflammatories in the health center, inviting people to practice some activities. So this type of experience of betting on the self-care on self-knowledge, so it balances this type of atrogeny that's losing autonomy and using more medicines, excessive interventions, and the social atrogeny that's really close to the cultural atrogeny, but that has a more complicated dimension. That is when we have problems. We have a way of thinking that when we have a problem that's quite frequent, quite common, we have collective causes. So a collective problem has collective causes. And we have a, ten we have a tendency of having problems that related to the way we live our lives. So the lack of social rights, the stress of the cities, inequality, the social one, the economical one, all of this getting people sicker. If you think about the food condition, obesity, the set of public health is urban policies, all of these are making people sicker. So we have a, a tendency of, in, of individualizing the problems and finding who are the good ones for these collective causes. So this is a type of atrogeny that's the hidden condition. You provide medicine, individualize this, and don't block the collective problem. 
So the health systems, when they need to handle with this risk, with these damages, and we have stories of interventions that end up causing issues at some point we were under the influence of the food industry contributing to decrease of the culture of the breastfeeding. So a lot of us went through a part of our lives eating trans fat, believing that we were eating well. So this relationship with the pharmaceutical industry, with the food industry, it brings uh, something that makes us suspicious. And sometimes these traditional medicines that are a little bit are a little bit older, they are not under these influences. They end up having a sense. They get space and modulate and protect people some, you know, a certain way. These difficulties they have a, a relationship with the philosophical fundament that feeds the thinking of biomedicine that's connected to some type of mechanism of a more Cartesian idea, this idea of nature as a machine, the idea of nature as something that will divide into pieces and each one is going to take care of one piece and in the end of the production line, you are going to have a person that's in a good condition. So this idea, it's quite strong. So depending on how we don't take care of the health system, it creates a logic and a feeling on people that they're not being taken care of because the responsibility of the professional is restricted in a segmented view that's really small. And we have indeed a part of the problems that we can treat well, treating that problems more severe conditions when the biological problem is more severe. So we can look at the person taking care of that problem. So we are taking care of well. But sometimes it goes beyond the situations. So this idea of the nature as a machine, of the human body as a machine, the possibility of fragmenting the infinite, and we don't have anyone to put all of this together. So this is a problem. And we can see the traditional medicines. They don't think like that. They are always making an effort for integration. Of course, they can look to the acute problem, to a part of need more care, but there's a different perspective. A quite important problem that's also related to the concept. It's a confusion between the object of the work and the tools for the work. In general, the humankind invents the system of health, the medicine, and the professions that appeared after that to take care of people. But depending on how this system works, the professional thinks that the, the object of the work is the disease. When they work with the disease, the person is a disturbance of the working process. The person is that the one that doesn't explain things well, doesn't obey, that bring a lot of problems and issues that they don't know what to do with that because they're looking at the disease, the focus of their specialty, and this is a problem of public health, of the systems of health, of what we call biomedicine, this medicine that's related to this perspective of science. So again, when we have contributions, mindset, creating rationalities that go into a different direction, they bring a positive contribution. So this clarity of that you are looking at people 
and that all the knowledge that you're going to have available, that you're going to look for all the devices, these are instruments for the work. There are tools that help you to take care, but they're not the object of your work. This is also a challenge. It's a philosophical fundament that's in the root of a number of problems. And also an important problem is a dichotomy that we only have in biomedicine that's radical between body and mind, psychosome. So this the division, it al allowed us to learn a lot of things in the separation. But we know nowadays in neuroscience and technologies and science that these things get together more than we imagined. So the separation, it's a separation that gets in the way. And these traditional medicines, the Chinese medicine also, they don't work with this separation. They work with integration. And last is an important point, is the idea of the nature as an adversary. This idea that we need to be protected when you use a lot of antibiotics, that this is dangerous, just recently, we saw the importance of the regular flora that's, that we are part of nature. But this is also an important difference. I'm going to ask now to see a little bit of Jorge Luis Borges' uh, small part. I will read now a part of the rigor of science of Luis Borges. In that empire, the artery of cartography reached a perfection that the map of one province would be in an entire city and the map of the empire, an entire province. Throughout time, these maps with different measures were not satisfactory and the colleges of cartography created the empire of the map that had the size of the empire and would match with that. The ones that didn't study cartography, the next generations understood that this dilated map was useless and they delivered this to the sun and the winter. On the deserts of the West, we had ruins of the map that we have animals and beggars. In the entire country, there is no other thing for the geography. Borges, with his geniality, he shows an important aspect of how we use the knowledge, especially the scientific knowledge. So in health, we have clear that what we build as a knowledge is something that we build based on reality, but it's not reality. So Borges is talking about this confusion between the map, that's something that to help us to handle with the reality, and the reality. And obviously, with his geniality, he brings this in a poetic way. But the problem is that in health, a lot of the time, we get a person through the diagnosis, our culture. It's quite strong. The lab tests, so if you have some alteration, and this transposition of a symbolic space that we isolate the variables to study a part or something that happened and a certain belief that isolating this, that we create the theory to do that, it is right, more, it is more right than reality. It's something that caused a lot of problems. So being modest regarding our knowledge, also, about the traditional medicines, but we need to have this perception that we have constructions that they're valid somehow, but they're not reality. So what we call disease in the bio biomedicine is not what we call disease in 100 years ago. So if you don't have a dogmatic position, we don't learn it. We need to learn about the limits of the knowledge of where it doesn't work. So This criticism, 
it help us to go from this dichotomy that we have, a place that we have the truth, the other doesn't have it. So the idea is not this. The idea is how we contribute of the point of view of health for a better care and how we assess. So, for example, in the clinical practice, it's quite common that we have that we have complaints that people make that doesn't make sense. And we have studies showing this, that in the urgent care, in the primary attention, an important percentage of the complaints of people we don't fit in, the, in a diagnosis. It's not because the person is having a problem of mental health. It's because the diagnosis is not total. It's not an absolute thing. It's something that we build on reality. So what we have in reality is people getting sick, the death and the disease. Our wisdom is what we build from that. One of the cafe philosophicals that we had was with Professor Mario Pereira with about mental health, and he used to talk about SB5, which is the book of uh, mental health diagnosis, and all of the investment in this construction of diagnosis, as if it was, if it's as if it were self-explanatory, but it is a set of uh, symptoms. So it is a path that brings damage as well. It's important to say that besides um, applying and uh, embracing the traditional medicines around the world, there, is, there are ways of facing problems. So maybe the first perception of the amount of knowledge, the amount of professionals could produce fragmentation and cause problems, it starts in the first news about an arrangement to address that it start after the Russian Revolution in 17, with the idea of a primary care, a public health near people's houses, a, a, a health center, and then it is changed in the 20s in England, and then it starts being implemented in public health systems around the world as of the Second World War. So the idea of a second of a primary care is different from the other points of service in a public health system that are marked by pathology, by age, by any specialty. Now, this is a responsabilization of those professionals by people. So the primary care has the challenge of placing a healthcare team responsible for those people as long as they live in that location. So this is a, an opposite point to what happens in the rest of the system. That's why they have tasks that are difficult to accomplish because there is a thought that is counter hegemonic and that is why that he, that in primary care at the public health system in brazil we have so many people practicing integrative practices and the traditional medicine because these medicines as they evolve over centuries in different realities that is usually less urban and not in a hospital environment. The hospital is very remarkable for biomedicine in a way of having a perspective of an extreme situation in the extreme sickness, in this closeness to death. So this biomedicine is different. And the other traditional medicine are not a space developed in a space of extremes. So they have more tools to prevent and to treat. So the primary care is the first movement. That's why in many countries in the world is the place that really embraces the traditional medicines. And in Brazil, the same happens. Besides that, besides all the problem that causes so many damages, as I mentioned, we still have an effort around the world, as well as in Brazil, to think about tools to help professionals deal with people. Besides 
diagnosis that all professionals have to carry. So there is a formulation called the narrative medicine, which is a perspective to help the to help the professional understand that there is a person there, there is a history there, and value that history, the experience in this process, so the professional can have a more in integral care. There's another uh approach that is a motivational interviewing using for nurses in a family care or the people-centric clinic method and the one we use the most in unicamp which is called the broadened and shared clinical practice and all those methodologies dialogue and uh, are in contact to integrative practices and traditional medicines a very Brazilian experience that was to face this Cartesian perspective of health approach is the National Policy of Humanization from 2000 that had the expectation of analyzing and giving visibility to the therapeutical relations, to the knowledge, so professionals could have criticism to the knowledge So there is a scenario, just to conclude all this trajectory, is a scenario in which you have a biomedicine that has lots of problems, lots of alternatives that were built within the field of biomedicine, but produces a more openness to traditional medicines and the traditional Chinese medicine in particular. So now I'm going to talk more about the Chinese traditional medicine. But I'm going to hear to Ayudo Kernato. So now two parts of the book ideas for delaying the end of the world from Ayuton Krenake. We have all been packed with the idea that we are humanity. Meanwhile, while the wolf doesn't arrive, we are alienated from this organism we are part of the earth and we start thinking that it is a thing and we are something else the earth and humanity and i don't realize where there is something that is not nature but everything is nature the cosmos is nature everything i can think of is nature in ecuador in colombia and in some of these regions in the andes there are places in which the mountains build couples. You have the mother, the father, the children. You have a family of mountains that exchange affection, make exchanges. And the people that live in these vales have parties for the mountains. They feed, they give presents, they gain presents from the mountains because they are forgotten and erased in favor of a globalizing narrative that is so superficial that want to tell the same history for us. So this book by Ayuton Krenaki brings first a perspective of our originary people of integration with nature. The idea that we are apart from nature is not shared by many traditional medicines, by many people, and our originary people would identify with the cosmology that is really the foundation of the Chinese medicine. So when we think of the possibility of integration to our health, health system, with our practices, we are thinking that the integration somehow may help us integrate with perspectives and people that are part of our history, that are part of our culture, but are silenced, are threatened. And a feeling that I've had I've had some learnings in Chinese medicine with immigrants. People that lived 
this experience of the classic Chinese medicine and this feeling of a cosmology, of a closer cosmology to our originary people is very strong because of the connection with nature, because of the pursuit for this connection, the understanding of nature. And so the expectation that uh, once we have a moment of reconfiguration of the forces, the geopolitics, we can, on this process of knowing the people in the South and getting closer to them, we can get to know our own people and our own cosmology and our humanities. So we talk a lot about Chinese medicine, but because it has a very long history, of over 20 centuries, it is not just Chinese, it's spread in the countries around China. So that are Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese versions, the countries around it are learning and uh, they have built different modules and different versions of the same original knowledge and inside china that are different mo different modalities that are different uh, schools so firstly this traditional knowledge is mixed it is permeable and there are different lines depending on the historical moment that we observe Obviously, we can make a differentiation between the older knowledge, which is very interesting because a part of the immigrants that came to Brazil, they keep some of this knowledge that is more ancient. And I'm going to characterize a little bit what we call the traditional Chinese medicine and the other part that is the knowledge that was appropriated by the Western world. So even though we have Japanese immigration from the beginning of the past century in smaller numbers, Chinese, Korean and all, the landmark of the arrival of the acupuncture in Brazil is as of a person that brought acupuncture in the 50s from Germany. So we have a source that was more valued, which are the immigrants more recently after that, but in the beginning they weren't, so officially our access to acupuncture comes from the colonizers, not from the South-South connection, and more recently as of this socialist revolution in China, there is a traditional Chinese medicine which is the syntax uh, that comes from the syncretism in this relation with the western world so now we have the presence of these three movements in brazil a culture in which the naming of the points in acupuncture that came from europe doesn't have the original names there were the, the names they use are, are numbers and letters that were uh, created by a Frenchman. So all these vertents are coexisting in Brazil. And then I'm going to specify it a little more. One point I would like to comment is the idea talking about the classic Chinese medicine, the immigrants that teach up to this day this type of medicine, they value a lot the practices of promotion, meditation, meditation in movements like Tai Chi Chuan, self-care. So this medicine has connections to monks, to the idea of self-care, some kind of martiality because Tai Chi Chuan has a speed, but behind that you have a martiality, an idea of fight behind that. So the classic medicine has a strong effort to produce autonomy, self-care, 
self-knowledge and acupuncture that came from other places is very heterogeneous that are there's a part of practice that is more symptomatic more pro following a protocol until you get to this moment where you accept acupuncture as long as that are the points i find some correlation and so it then it ends up being a very symptomatic kind of acupuncture And the traditional Chinese medicine, now what it brings to us now is this care somehow similar to the biomedicine about the type of relationship, a sick person being taken care of by another person in a more passive way, a patient, but similar to what we know here, but the, the structure, it's more related to hospital of severe disease, more complicated things that we don't have a tradition here of care. Our tradition uh, in the Western world, when we have a more severe problem, we are going to be taken care of by biomedicine. In China, it's not like that. We have this difference A more strong use, hospital that is going to take care of severe disease. And this has always been a shocking experience for the people from the Western. For the Nixon collective that went to China. I know a lot of people that went for different reasons for China. And they get amazed by seeing something that's unknown from us. And they can handle with problems that to us, apparently there's only one way of handling with that problem. So these three variables are present now and are important. Also something that's important to mention, when we think in the traditional Chinese medicine, it's not only acupuncture, it's a world. We have different types of acupuncture, we have cranial one, the acupuncture that use the map of the hand, electrical one, we have different things. But besides that, we have massages. So we have this idea. We have different names, different schools of massages in the Chinese medicine. And also in the traditional Chinese medicine, 7% of the treatments are with phytotherapics. So one of the reasons that the Western has not incorporated phytotherapy is that it requires an assimilation of the way of thinking, of the type of clinical thinking of the Chinese medicine. So this is a little bit more complicated and sometimes the techniques, the practice of acupuncture can, bore, can be more simple and it doesn't require the assimilation of, of not diagnosis, but the patterns and diagnosis that the Chinese medicine makes. So this challenge also make the Western world to be more with acupuncture. Another challenge is that we don't have the tea culture. Sometimes it's not too pleasant to our tasty buds, and for them, maybe not, but it's part of their culture. And physiotherapy is close to other therapies. Just to bring this idea that this field of physiotherapy is a strong area in the Asian countries, not only China, that use this medical rationality. And last, the body practices that we know a lot and that are assimilated in the public health system in Brazil. I think that a lot of people know a part of fundamental the Chinese medicine is known. It's related with this Yunnan 
idea, analogy of the human body with elements of nature. These elements, they have some type of movement. We have five movements. And this unfolds to diagnosis and patterns that people call patterns of change. And from this point on, a lot of centuries later, so when we get closer, we realize that something difficult to know the size of this. What is when we have an accumulation of knowledge that goes through centuries? A formulation, for example, this is 200 years old that has been used. A formula, we have different plants. So this type of thinking is tested through a lot of time. So we need to suspect that a lot of things, something is going to work that tested for centuries and that people say, when we see the situation, we do this, we get to this other result. As we have lived a process of colonization that was quite practical, but also regarding to culture, sometimes we have this idea that there's only one valid knowledge if it's what we have done in our culture and so on. So these people, they have this wisdom for a long time. And they have tested this paradigm, this way of thinking about sickness, about the relationship with nature, and thinking in a whole way that people have this relationship with nature as a whole. We could say in this space to discuss philosophy, Nietzsche, Spinoza, and we mentioned that Spinoza, he used to say, we don't know what the body can do. So when we look at these traditional medicines, we have a, a feeling that they went too far of what the body can do. As they had the practice, we have a set of philosophers that criticized this, this more hegemonic philosophy, Platon, and we have these traditional medicines and the Chinese medicine as they have read and said, let's do like this. If it's not this way, let's try this other way. So the Chinese medicine is one that works with this perspective. So there's a system that we can understand that doesn't need to go against the biomedicine, it can be complementary in important aspects, but it is totally different and it invites us to understand the sickening process and to think possibilities of care that are different. So if one side we have a tendency of thinking in an isolated way to think about pathology and pieces of people, this segmented approach, and go to the limit of that. On the other side, we have a perspective that's going to try look in, entirely looking at this globally. And we also have on one side a dynamic that's centralized in the fixed diagnosis that's there, that exists. And if it doesn't exist, there's nothing we can do. 
so it's in an essential way. So the mythology as the disease being a separated being. And on the other side, in the Chinese medicine, we have a more fluid logic to look the patterns, how this is changing, where they are going. This perspective of thinking the connections between things, how something is, is influentiating another. This perspective of not separating the affections from the body, separate the mind from the body, it's also an important contribution. And we have a strong tradition of our metaphors of treatment they are associated to the war. They were against this, against that. If we think, for example, our paradigm about oncology, it was centered on the war against the tumor. Now we have a number of possibilities in a different perspective, immunotherapy and so on. But the Chinese medicine doesn't share this perspective. There's always an effort, not only Chinese medicine or the traditional medicines too, but the effort of looking, how can I get in a harmon uh, this can be more harmonical, how can I have a balance in a limitation situation? We have a tendency of putting people in too rigid rules if it is the right lab test, if there is a determined problem, if sometimes it's difficult to see what is the person beyond that problem that the person is going through. So these medicines also help. They have this perspective on betting on the strength of people. In a less idealistic view, or the person is cured or not, a more realistic view of the care. To conclude, I would like to say that the majority of people we have in Brazil, a lot of health professionals that went to find this knowledge in the last years. And we are going through a moment of the point of view of a uh, geopolitical point of view that all these people that were colonized, colonized, that they had their knowledge decreased, In the case of Americas, we lost. We had 1,000 languages. We have some hundreds only. We have lost a lot of people. So we understand that we're going through a moment that this closeness of the South people, this possibility of looking at ancestral knowledge, our originary people, I have the expectation that we can, from these reunions of this appreciation of this wisdom, we can appreciate our people here, uh, appreciate cosmologies that have similarities, have connections. And obviously, from this is what I want to bring here to Ayutu Kanaki, because we have a challenge of thinking about the relationship with nature, uh, the way that we handle that biomedicine is part and brought us to here. So we need to find a way of getting out of here with this ancestral knowledge and other perspectives related to nature. They have important things to teach us. So that's it. Thank you very much.
On behalf of everyone that is watching us over the internet, I'd like to thank you. And there are many compliments. So Marcos Antonio Lorenzo says that uh, the intelligence of the speaker and the serenity is amazing. Alexa said, amazing talk. People said, I love Café Filosofico. The speakers are so intelligent. They add so much knowledge for us. Congratulations to the creators and everyone related to the cafes. So thank you for all these kind words. And now we are going to start. Just a warning for you here. If you want to ask anything, the ones in person, you just raise your hands and you can ask on the microphone, or you can write down on a paper, I can read it, and on the internet, just write down on the chat, we're taking notes, and I'm going to start reading the questions. But to start off, because there are 20 years of Café Philosophical, we select from our uh, whole uh, history something that has to do with that. So we want to show you a video for you to comment. When does medicine start? I don't think medicine starts with Hippocrates. It starts way before that. So anthropologically speaking, when does something start with that we can say here medicine is born so i started thinking about that maybe when the first animal took care of another animal that was sick and as far as i know the human is the only animal to do that or do you know any other animals that take care of the other when they are sick there is no other so look, I'm not talking about a mother taking care of a pup. It's not medicine, it's maternal care. The dogs, they can lick their paws if they're hurt. Cats can eat certain plants when they feel sick, but this is instinct, it's not medicine. Medicine is born when someone had a gesture uh, a loving gesture, if you agree with me, right? To take care of someone else that got sick. It's not taking care of themselves because taking care of yourself is instinctive. So medicine is about that. I looked for any animals that did that and there is no one. So the closest thing we have is some domesticated animal, home animals that take care of the other. It's not part of nature. So medicine ends up being one of the things that differentiates us humans from other animals. There are certain things that only humans do. The elaborated language, burying their dads, cooking, and medicine. So it's a loving act that humanizes us. It's one of the traits of humanity is medicine. I believe there is an aspect that is the matter of, in this process, there are many the humanities and many the medicines. This is one of, it's an important point. And all of them have their value, have their place and their limitations. I think this is an important matter as well. There's one thing he mentions that I would like to comment, which is, there is a commitment, a tacit commitment of medicine and other health related professions, which is the commitment with taking the best clinical decision, making the best clinical decision for the one that is uh, receiving the care. So this is a commitment that medicines just take so they are taking care, so they have the commitment of take, making the best decision. With the process of uh, mercantilization of the medicine in the US and also in Brazil, this principle, this elementary principle ends up being lost. So the scary concept that many people have heard of, and there is a logic of judicialization of medicine, which is a defensive medicine, as if it were natural for a person to make a clinical decision that is going to protect them in an eventual lawsuit. So this is a breach of a social contract that comes back 
millennia. So it's like an attacking kind of medicine. So that kind of mercantilization of medicine is new and it's perverse and it's terrible for the countries that transform health in a product. So this is something that we really have to avoid to the most. As they complimented the curator, I'm going to call the curator to participate and ask a question for you. Thank you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Bruno Di Conte. I'm the professor of the Economics Institute in Unicamp and the director of uh, the Confucius Institute. And I would like to congratulate and thank you, Gustavo, for the beautiful, very interesting class. And ask you about one of the practices of the traditional medicine and the Chinese traditional medicine that you just mentioned. I would like you to go a little deeper, which is the practice that goes against what the contemporary society and life uh, happens now now so the meditative practice when we have so many so much information so many messages on whatsapp all the time we have no time off so tell us a little bit because sometimes people are afraid of being alone being silenced and uh, Miyakoto says that uh, in silence is well accepted. So they say, he says that when he leaves Africa, the other societies, the Western societies are, are afraid of the silence. So tell us a little bit about the meditative practice and how accessible it is to every one of us. Thank you. So thank you, Bruno, for your question. And also, once again, thank you for coordinating this module. These practices of meditation are endless in the Ayurveda medicine, in the Chinese medicine, in other variations. They are diverse and in the Western world, we have a mix of meditation, so people have taught, and it's an important contribution for the public health, the experience with mindfulness that we synthesize, we take a little bit of wisdom from a different place and we teach people to meditate. And there are so many studies showing the positive effect of all that. and how it possibly impacts in health problems. And it's very common up to this day, the professionals that don't have the meditative practice nor any knowledge about the medicines that originated the practice. It's very common for them to recommend meditation because it has been proven that it has positive effects. The curiosity here is that within the Chinese medicine and somehow it is probably true in the Ayurveda and the yoga practices that there is a non-separation between meditation and movement. There is the possibility of the meditation when you're standing still. For those who are meditated, they are not standing still. There are many things going on, but the Chinese medicine works with the movement kinds of practice of meditation like Tai Chi and Pakwa, so a different concept of meditation. And uh, curiosity is that they have this concern of doing aerobics without increasing their heartbeat. We have this concern with heartbeat up to a different age. We start saying, okay, work out, but don't go up this heartbeat, and they always have this concern. They say you have to work out without increasing their heartbeat. So they call it meditation in movement. And Lian Kung is a success in Brazil. It's very curious. Bruno is going to remember that once we were talking about it and he said, no, I don't know who Lian Kung is. So it's a practice, an extract of movements created by an orthopedic uh, Chinese that uh, gained the world as a practice of uh, meditative movement and relaxant movement in a way that provo 
provokes us with the idea that movement meditation don't necessarily need to be a part. They may have some congruence. So this is the kind of very interesting knowledge. And we digest that we're doing other things, but we continue. We have noticed that it is very, very valuable for the West, the, the wisdom of, now, of uh, meditation. A question that came through Instagram by Glaze. She asks us, what is the traditional uh, Chinese medicine when facing technology? I think one of the things that we observe in the Asian countries in general is the integration of the medicines. This process is not so easy. It has some losses, but I believe it is inevitable. It's the process of looking because care is complex. So even though we don't look at integrative practices, care is not in the horizon of, oh, the problem is X, and so just one professional can bring results to that. So with aging of population, chronic diseases, we have a, we need to have this conversation. So as, uh, the more options we have, the more different paradigms we have, the more we can transit transit from one part to the other, the better. But of course, technology brings risks because sometimes we imagine if we remember eliting the idea of counterproductivity, the automotive vehicles are great and they would make us coming faster than going by horse or on foot. But the way, depending on the way we use it in a city, we can even not move and it's going to be easier to go on foot because of traffic. So it's not the technology in itself that defines the matter, but rather how we are going to use it and how we are thinking of this process of getting ill and we include people that are sick when sharing decision making so there is a set of factors but i don't think it's going to be possible not to have this conversation and the asian countries in general have been doing that we imagine for example i can't imagine in someone to just uh, give up on orthopedics on, on a case of trauma or an emergency or extreme situation, our medicine is amazing. So the surgical labor or, you know, we are not in a position of choosing one or the other. We are in a position of learning to compose and integrating. It's not simple, it's not easy, but it is the best use we can make of all of these elements. Another question, a question from the audience now. Introduce yourself, please. So good evening, I'm Paulo Henrique Campos. I am a professional of acupuncture and my question is related to the techniques. You mentioned the difficulty of assimilating physiotherapy and I see that it is actually easier to work with acupuncture, that is a, a better acceptance of acupuncture in comparison to other techniques like the ventosa or the mochas. But we know that in China, as you mentioned, phytotherapy cells uh, come from 70% of the cases. So what is your view in terms of phytotherapy, and uh, do you think there is going to be a better acceptation? Is it going to be more encompassed, or there is this blockage that is far from being um, 
overcome. I believe there are advances, uh, something that uh, provides some advance is the use of uh, physiotherapy in extracts in a dry matter that makes it easier. But people that know both uses in teas and uh, dry extracts, well, the tea is more effective. They say it's stronger, but, but so this is an advance and I understand that We, the, the healthcare, it involves a lot of resources and powerful interests of big industrial sectors. So it's difficult for us to use physiotherapy, even the physiotherapy of our traditions here from Brazil, because we have a pressure of the market, of the pharmaceutical industry funding all of this, being biased. So we have difficulties with the alternatives that are going against these interests. So I think this is one thing, not only about the Chinese medicine, but the phytotherapy as a whole. And my example of the use of the phytotherapy in the Western is the Cuba example. When when we have the decrease of this, well, they got closer from China and they embedded this Chinese medicine and they were using it is the idea of integration. Imagine an island of 11 million people that they can have three vaccines for this. So this edge technology of a people of this size with this population the same time with therapy in the Cuban system, they don't are going against any knowledge. It's a strong presence since this period. And it's quite curious. We had Cuban doctors in a program called Mais Magicus, and they were intimidated of prescribing physiotherapy because it's a pressure of the medicine of the drugs they knew, but they, they would think it's better to prescribe what people know. So some of them for some time, when they people had more trust, they were able to do what they did in Cuba. So we, I think that's necessary for any health system to get this knowledge even of the point of view of the autonomy of people to understand a little bit how we can use on their daily routines the chi the teas and have more autonomy and this can be part of self care in our culture we have a question through video from Caio Fabio is the master degree of public health Hi, Gustavo. I would like to ask you a question, a philosophical provocation about how the scientific evidences approach or they don't approach this point of the change in paradigm up to when they explore this change in paradigm in a medicine focused on health versus a medicine focused on disease. And in your opinion, what are the paths to create this development and make this we can unfold this into and how can we have this bridge between the contemporary science with this ancestral knowledge in this paradigm view That's thank you Caio Caio is the VP of the academic consortium of integrative health so if you go well, look for this on the internet, you're going to find a spreadsheet full of studies about all this and the evidences and the studies from the therapeutical techniques. So it's an effort, a big effort of a lot of researchers of, in Brazil of in putting together and to recognize that this type of study has an importance, has a contribution for us to assess the practices. 
So this is an effort that Cloud is involved that's really important and it needs to continue. And it's an effort for the biomedicine to an achievement of this type of clinical assay. And we see how valid is some therapies, if they work or they don't work. And, but we have some issues. When we think all the studies about the primary care, this primary care, it's a place that we, where we take care of people and we have a long follow-up. So we have questions. These clinical assays, I don't know if all of you know, but when we're going to study a drug, we select people that only have that type of problem. And for the student to be good, it must be like this. But these people, they don't represent the common people. For example, someone that has two diseases wouldn't be selected for the trial for one disease, depending on the history of the person, if the, the person underwent a surgery, the person is not going to be selected. So there's a big discussion. There's a researcher of primary care, the Ministry of Health. In 2000, she published her book of primary care, The Balance Between Needs. And she mentions this. We cannot expect to make decisions in the primary care having studies for everything, because when we look at this, when you put all of them together through a decade, we see they go against one another. They help, but getting back to the metaphor of the map of Borges, it's not possible to taking a study as the full truth. So this is the first thing, but there's also a challenge so we always look in health, the things in not uh, an absolute way. It's good to have this evidence study, yes, but it's the last thing. No, it's, it's helpful, but we need to look in a careful way. So, for example, we could look at someone taking care of with Chinese medicine and say the person got a flu and they're taking a ginger tea with cinnamon and so on. So ginger and cinnamon are good for flu, more or less. What we call a flu or a virosis for the Chinese medicine are different diagnoses that are going to change really quick. If some days it's cold and then it's hot, if you give the ginger three days later, you are making the person worse. So it's difficult to have a study of evidences of another rationality with the diagnosis of our rationality. There are different trials and studies of acupuncture for headache, but you got a cake recipe for headache and you check if that works. Okay, acupuncture is amazing that a lot of, many of the times it will work, but an acupuncturist it's going to modulate this recipe. It's going to individualize the care because the, this person will look the patterns there. So there's a challenge of the point of view of the studies and sometimes it's difficult to have a dialogue between the studies in these Asian countries in China with ours it's something new, Nelson mentioned this, the first day of this module, that in the International Code of Disease, we're going to have the possibility of talking about the patterns of me Chinese medicine. And it's good to amplify this for all the rationalities, but the challenge of creating studies of a different rationality that you need to understand what the other person is saying, what they are doing to be able to assess this. So if you're going to do on the place of the other with your reading that, you can get a different conclusion or a wrong conclusion. So we have all the details. So this is for Chinese medicine, but it's also for all the rationalities besides biomedicine. So we have this complexity. It has a complexity of the studies themselves. 
to handle with the reality. They are important contribution, but they have limitations. We have a problem that we know for so many decades and the solution is simple, but we don't have political power not here and not even in other countries. But we have a lot of studies that the database, our pharmaceutical industry have the study and they store this data. So they choose to publish what they wanted to publish. So there's a book that the Brazilian Medicine Society funded the publishing in Brazil. You can find the book on the internet. So deadly drugs and organized crime from Denmark. So it is going to explain the functioning of two decades of the process of the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a way of working, of functioning. So how to solve this? So we know it's public survey instead of research, instead of the pharmaceutical research, open data, so everyone can see how it works. So we also have these issues, and these are also part of the process. And we know that we need public universities, we need research, everything that was almost destroyed in six years that we are getting back now. So it's fundamental to have studies that have the commitment of assessing the therapeutical selection and all of that. A question that we got from the internet, the question is, it starts saying that we are following the discussion of a law on the Senate to have a regulation for the practice of acupuncture that's part of the Chinese medicine, even though the traditional Chinese medicine is part of the complementary practice of the public health system since 2006. And the question is, do you think it's a positive movement or is it a threat? Can we have a debate in a negative condition regarding the benefits of the TCM? I think that this project, this regulation, it brings a symptom that's one of our country. We have a problem. The majority of the countries that they have public system, for example, the Brazilian government pay for the majority of the medical specializations, but the government, the interests, the needs of health, not always they can define the quantity of professionals that will be graduated into a specialty. So this is a trivial thing in countries with public health system. The government defines how is going to be the background of these professionals and it defines how many experts of each type the country needs. Brazil, we are going through a situation that the professional corporations, they have a chronic excess of power. So, for example, as different countries, we have the optometricity, a person that goes to college and the person is prepared to be there in a store, the glass store, and to check the eyes of people. But this is a problem for this person to work in a lot of parts of the, the road. This person can work and takes to the ophthalmologist only the task of someone that needs to handle with surgery and other complexities that needs different and difficult procedures and complex procedures. So we have a challenge with this. If you think that we have people that can deliver babies, but they cannot work with that. So this type of dispute about the compuncture, Chinese medicine, we have the monopoly of doctors or other professionals can do this. I personally defend that it, yes, it works in different countries, Western countries. The experts on that rationality, they define how should be the background and is the ones that wants to go through that study to be prepared to work on that practice. So I think this is the best arrangement. I don't think that we should have a monopoly for any profession. Everyone that has the proper 
knowledge, we need to discuss what would be that, should be able to practice. So I think that the Western countries, I think this is the best arrangement, but all this polemic is something to a dispute of the market that's not good for health. And it happens in different professions and other professions besides the medicine try to do this too. The person goes to India, you study yoga. No, but we don't study physical education, so you cannot teach that. So it's a type of logic that's quite present in our country, and it's a problem. I think that we need to define criteria for people to practice. To give yoga classes or judo classes, different criteria that are related to who owns that knowledge. So it's curious because a big part of the practitioners of uh, acupuncture in Brazil are immigrants from Chinese, Japanese people. And suddenly these people that own the knowledge here, okay, so you know nothing, we know it and you can't practice it. So it's a weird situation and uh, consider uh, the health system in Brazil, we have this excess of power in the hands of corporations, defending their own market interests. And it's a certain kind of fragility to defend the public interest and criteria that are good to improve the working of the public health system. Gustavo, we are at the end of our Café Filosófico, but I would like to ask you for your final words. I would like to thank a lot for your presence everyone watching us over the internet as well. I would like to thank Café Filosófico because I'm a fan, so for inviting me. I'd say that it has been very good having the opportunity of um, approaching this topic that is not often so available for us to talk about, not only the Chinese medicine, but integrative practices. So I would like to thank it. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Applause is for you too. And Gustavo, let me thank on behalf of everyone that watched you over the internet, many compliments for you. And the reading by Kiko, Kaku, Ukayo, the, the participation of Bruno too with his questions and for you who are in Campinas if you want to take pictures on the scenario you can do that just use Instituto CPFL as a hashtag it would be great to repost your stories and our message for everyone follow us on our YouTube channel Café Filosófico CPFL to know more about anything new in our program, the new videos we have every week. And this Saturday, the 16th, we are going to have on TV the philosophy of Confucius uh, debate on the uh, Western world. And on Sunday, the transformation of paternity with Marcos Bianchi. Next week on the 15th, sorry, on the 21st, on Thursday, we start a new module called Mind in Focus, a global compact with the impact of the technology in the Western world. And you are invited to come back here for this talk in Café Filosófico CPFL for next week. Thank you. Saturday, who was the thinker in China? In China? Confucius and his philosophy in the special series China, Reflections about Confucianism. The spirit of Confucianism has as our core value the practice of humanity, uh, shared humanity. Is there a possible world to happen if we are willing to build it and to be a part of the construction of this world? Saturday, 10.30 p.m. at Café Filosófico. Sunday, the dynamic of the relationships, the maternal and paternal functions, all of this has been rethought and questioned. Does it make sense on these days to have the traditional paternal figure 
life in movement and the movements of life. We live in a country that has 5.5 million people of children that don't have their parents name, the father's name on their birth certificate. The transformation of paternity and the research show in the last decades that a participative father has a formidable impact in the life of a child. Sunday, 9 p.m., sorry, 7 p.m. at Café Filosófico.